Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. This is Andy from Finding Value Finance. I changed it up there, if you noticed. So today we're gonna go over um, some fractals and I wanna talk about market conditions, how these things play out, herd mentality, timeframes, all that stuff. It's, it's ultra important because if you don't understand this, you're not gonna have the holding capability to hold on to this thing, especially in the beginning of the bull market. The beginning of the bull market is the toughest part to hold uh, in any bull market. And the reason is when things move in waves, generally speaking, the biggest pullback happens after the first wave into the second wave. We are in the middle of the second wave or potentially ending the second wave at some point, hopefully soon. So the second wave is the hardest wave to hold through. And I know a lot of people, you know, if you don't have the confidence to hold through it, uh, they sell out and they leave. But the big, the biggest wave is the third wave of the up wave. It goes first, third, and fifth. The first wave and the fifth wave uh, are generally similar. Uh, the fifth wave can have an extended move, uh, which makes the fifth wave bigger than the first wave potential. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you those waves. I'm going to show you the fractals. Um, what a fractal is, just so you guys understand, a fractal is a pattern that repeats over time. It can happen at different time frames or lengths, but the pattern is the same. So in the beginning of the last bull market, you we had three waves and we had the fractals move on. I can compare that with the current today's fractal to see where we're at. And this is where you can gain a lot of confidence in holding on to your investment because then you kind of know where we're at uh, in the cycle. And it also paints the picture that the cycle is still young. And it also paints the picture that, that the thesis or the business cycle or my thoughts around that cycle is, is gaining evidence or, or having objective evidence or non-biased evidence to support where we are in the business cycle and thesis. That, that's why I do it. I need unbiased uh, information. I don't care about a person's opinion. I don't care about an inverted yield curve necessarily. Those are all things that are resultants or they are symptoms of a larger manifestation of something. That's what the resultant is. So it's kind of like, I don't have a good analogy off the top of my head, but it's, it's something where something's driving on the front end. And as long as that is driving, we're okay. The back end, which are the reactants to the driver, is stuff like interest rates and whatever. And let me describe that really quick because it's important to understand this as an investor, especially one that wants to be incredibly successful. What happens is your drivers and your leaders, they, they drive change. That is your housing market. That is your uh, interest rates. So the housing market and the credit expansion drives interest rates higher. Let me explain how that happens, all right? When inflation comes into the system, so we get, we get a large credit expansion, it's inflationary. What that does is people react to that inflationary pressure. They don't necessarily know where it's coming from. Some people don't know where it's coming from. So they react to it. And the market, this is called market conditions or what I call market conditions. Um, these patterns are created by the reaction of humans. So what happens is inflation comes into the system and, and, and people react. And what they react to is an inflationary surge. That inflationary surge or that higher rate of inflation creates a environment or market conditions that people react to differently. So they start to change their behaviors in the market. We can see those behaviors changing on a long-term time scale with the changing patterns. That is what gives us the full circle confirmation that's non-biased back to the thesis. I know, I, I, so guys, I didn't read any books on this. I'd made it all up myself. So this is, this is coming from an engineering background with a lot of math and science and physics. <laughs> Looking at data uh, and a continuous improvement uh, I, I've done. A, I, I just I'll sidetrack here real quick. I've done a lot of analysis with root cause analysis, and what you look at are are conditions and actions. 
you can you can control certain things uh and and the whole thesis that i've basically developed i didn't read any books on this it's all developed by myself is is it's rooted in kind of root cause analysis uh, which you can also use because you basically become an investigator doing these types of analysis to find the root cause of a problem and and the way that you look at this is you look at the conditions and that's where everything kind of lies under so when you when you get this inflation that comes into the system it puts the bond market into what's called a real negative rate which means that if you're getting paid a low interest rate and the inflation rate is greater than your interest rate people don't like losing purchasing power so they sell their bonds and buy new higher interest rate bonds perhaps but that puts a downward pressure on the bond market which causes money to rotate when that money starts to rotate in the bond market interest rates start to go up because there's less buyers than sellers that increasing interest rate also changes the calculations of net present value in the stock market so all of the stocks in the market are discounted future cash flows to today using the interest rate that's on the 10-year yield so as the 10-year yield or whatever interest rate they want to use in their calculations as the 10-year yield goes higher they're using a higher interest rate to discount their net present value calculations back to today using a higher interest rate which means today's value of those stocks drop they're less willing to speculate in stocks now that they can get a higher interest rate return on the 10-year bond that is the reaction or the narrative behind why people are doing these things you'll also see from a kind of just a normal person if if more money comes into the system and it's inflationary prices of things start to rise and what happens is money redirects differently in those environments it might get redirected more towards spending on food gasoline heating your house and utilities buying a house and all of those certain things if the housing market goes into a shortage home prices go up and then that credit expansion all that money coming to the system pushes a lot of other prices up so money gets redirected from the normal people and they have to spend more of their income towards gasoline food and and residential home or rent or whatever it is so money gets directed differently so it's a two double-edged sword there for growth stocks money gets directed away from technology stocks to some degree towards the needs of humans you know the, the living we'll, we'll call it human living needs versus the want the wants of uh, the, the person so money gets rejected from redirected from the demand consumer side and investment money also gets redirected differently as well the greater the change in the interest rate the greater the change of the money flows money coming into a stock is what pushes a stock higher money coming out of a stock or or sector makes it go lower so money flows is what is driving all of this and we can see through patterns and fractals fractals are patterns that repeat over time given the market conditions that i'm describing that change because these humans all basically respond in the same manner they're just different sizes of the fractals and a fractal is much like your hand it's like genetics or dna of a stock um a bigger hand and i've got pretty big hands actually um i, I found that out it's like bigger than everyone at work look at that you guys like that <laughs> it's it's uh my measurement from here to here is almost i think it's like almost 11 inches or so but um if you if you look at it the size of your palm if you know the size of the palms you would say generally speaking with some sort of confidence that a larger palm is going to produce a larger finger so you can kind of guess what that is a larger fractal of a first wave can produce a larger move of a third wave of a stock in, in elliott wave theory so it's the genetics of a stock so that's what um i look at is one i can tell where we're at given the fractal kind of where we're at and how large the move could potentially be and what we could do is we can look at some of these fractals together and i'll give you my opinions again the fractal doesn't necessarily mean that it will give us the exact timing because sometimes these can drag a little bit different sometimes they can shoot up and then and then pause at different places uh, but i think generally speaking it gets us in a ballpark 
a ballpark of the right framework and mindset that we should be in, given where we are in the market. So let's look at crude oil. Let's look at the S&P 500. Let's look at some of these to get more data on where we could potentially be. Now, I zoomed in on this. Everyone likes to view charts, you know, all zoomed in like this, right? They want to be zoomed in. They want to catch the little move. Uh, this is a falling wedge. It's broken to the upside. We've got the nice candlestick patterns that I really like on the right-hand side uh, for it to go potentially higher. And it doesn't have to go higher immediately. Just calm down, everybody. I'm not saying it's just going to move. But what we can do is we can back out, right? <clears throat> so let me take those lines off. Everyone's looking at the short term. Oh, my God, it went down. Oh, my God, it went up. Okay, I get it. Let's look at the long term, and let's see what I'm going to do here. So here's a fractal, right? What this fractal is, this is the bottom of the market, and we come on up one wave, third wave, and then maybe a fifth, and then we go to a double top. We do a little Batman pattern. There's, hey, Batman. And then I think we're bottoming out uh, here because we've broken out of that to the upside of that falling wedge. So there is a pattern there. So let's see if we see that pattern in the last bull market at the beginning of that bull market. Because if I say that this is wave one here, well, then that should be wave one, right? Wave one should look like that. So if the fractals are the same. So here's the old bull market right here, right? And here we go. This is the, the beginning of the bull market, 98, 99, uh, right at the bottom here, December 98 goes all the way up and comes all the way back. Now, what I did is I grabbed this fractal. This here is a considered a fractal right there, right? So I took this, which is the, the same pattern as the beginning of the last bull market for crude oil from 98 all the way till 2002. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to compare this fractal to the, to the previous fractal. And what I did is I copied this and I moved it over. So I, I moved that over and I'm going to show you the comparison here. So there it is, right? Here is the fractal. Let me let me do this real quick, guys. I'm going to re resize this so it looks a little bit better for you. Do this, move it over. Okay. So there's the fractals there. Now check this out, right? This guy here is this first move there. That's that move. Right? We come on up and you can see that the beginning of the, the spot is right here. You can see that same motion. And you can see the big this big pullback here is this big pullback here. We come to a top. Here's one top, two top. This one looks a little bit different. So we've got one top, two top. We also kind of come up into a wedge and, and broke out to the downside. Now, everything's not going to be perfect, but we did come up to a little wedge like that. We came back on down. We came across. This guy here, in my opinion, is probably this guy here. We've come back down and we've done our little bottoming there. This was the end of wave two. This could potentially be the end of wave two. That fractal is basically the same as what we're going through today. If we were to look at that. Um, so the fractals line up and the movements of how the herd of humans interacting with each other aligns with the other. Uh, fractal of the last bull market. So I would say that this is pretty close to being uh, a, a good match. And I can also take this fractal and overlay it. So you guys can see, and it won't be perfect, but here's the overlaid fractal there. There it is. And you can see the fractal and how this all plays out. Now, this fractal is not exactly the same. Uh, I can also smush it up and, and, and get it to align here. So let's look at the dailies here. I'm on weeklies. We go, we go to the dailies. We back out a little bit. You can see how this kind of aligns here. Um, and, and what we've got here is this is the alignment here. This guy is the, the waves coming here. That's the topping pattern right there. And then we come on down, and this is smushed up on the right hand side. It's very smushed. And you can see even how that aligns almost perfectly at the back here of where we're at today. We might have one little down move. Hard to say. It doesn't, it's not going to match perfectly. What I'm trying to do is and say is, this is pretty close to a match here. And maybe I'm off a little bit. I don't know. I don't, I don't see where I am. But I'm just showing you guys what the fractal is. Now, that means that we are probably wave one and wave two, the way that that thing has aligned. If we come back, what if we align it just for the heck of it to see where it's at. 
So I can take this entire fractal, and if the bull market of what's coming is to align, and I'll, I'll adjust this, don't worry guys. If this were to align, and I adjust the first fractal roughly to what that looks like, what that means, and if this bull market were to repeat, we would get something that looks like that. Because what I'm doing is I'm tying the beginning point, the top point, and then this comes back a little bit more during the first one, we could see a price of maybe six hundred dollars in crude oil, and and that's ba <clears throat> that's based off of the old fractal overlying the new fractal. Now, does that mean that's what I think is going to happen? I don't know. I'm just overlaying it and saying, well, if they overlaid, this is what it looks like. Does it mean that we get to five or six hundred dollars a barrel oil? Uh, yeah, it would. It would probably mean that if your valuations of a gold to oil ratio goes back to a one to six ratio or so because a one to six ratio uh, in that environment. And we're talking about market conditions here, guys. I don't know what the market conditions are going to be in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years or in the year 2030 at the end of the bull market and, and all of the retail sector and institutional money is rotated over uh, because they are convinced that this is going to go forever. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know. But Looking at that, if we were to go to a one to six ratio, and let's say gold at that time is like $4,000 divided by six, well, that's $666 a barrel. Maybe that's on the low end. I don't know. I, I'm, again, I'm not trying to, this isn't a price projection. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, I guess, give your mind flexible options of thoughts. <laughs> you like that wording, huh? Flexible options. Now, if this is the case, and we're seeing this in crude oil, that fractal that lines up, we should be seeing similar fractals in other areas besides crude. So let's take a look at some other areas and see if we see other uh, fractals that are also uh, showing themselves. So let's, let's look at natural gas for the heck of it, right? So what I did in natural gas is I took this fractal here, and I'll, I'll do it real time with you guys, all right? So here's the fractal going on. That is a Livermore cylinder pattern. I grabbed this fractal here of the last bull market. The last bull market started in 1998-99. So that's the bottom there, just like I did in the other one. We had one big wave, a big pullback in natural gas, and then we went all the way up third wave down and then the fifth. And it's kind of distorted because of hurricanes and weather and all this weather-related stuff. Now, if I take this old fractal and I put it over the new one, tell me how well this potentially lines up. So let's go and, and look to see how this thing lines up. And I can obviously manipulate this to some, to some extent to get you guys um, into it. So there's the fractal there, right? So this guy here, this first humps this guy, that guy, and it comes down, we come on up, we do another hump, and then this is distorted to some degree, uh, the way that this is distorted here. And then this guy is basically, the hump is that guy, that one's this one, that guy's this guy. And we've come on down, and I do think that we are trying to put in some sort of bottom here um, if we are trying to bottom. Now, I can manipulate this. It's very sensitive, but that, that's what it looks like. And per perhaps this is about the peak, that we get a bottom roughly where we're at, and maybe we do a, a move like this. I don't know. We'll see. But that's the, that's the fractal of last time, and it looks very similar. So natural gas did the same thing last bull market with this gigantic pullback in the beginning of that bull market. And we're doing the same thing now. And that, that bull market back then led to a massive move uh, shortly thereafter. So this is, this is the, the bull market here. Uh, the the one two three four five six seven with that hump there that's the bottom right there uh, of a potential buy point for a Jesse Livermore accumulation cylinder here, and that led to a monster run in natural gas all the way up to fourteen or fifteen dollars. That's that monster run, and then it even did a double top kind of in two thousand eight. So that's that monster run that came, and I. You know, perhaps we're doing something very similar to that and that the energy crisis isn't over yet, which is of my opinion. So that's natural gas. Let's look at 
SPX. So SPX is the S&P 500. And when we look at the S&P 500 and we, we lo- tap into the commodity booms, they happened during an increasing interest rate environment where the stock market goes sideways. Uh, this was the first, we'll call this the first commodity boom, second commodity boom, third commodity boom, and we're going into a fourth commodity boom. If we're going into a commodity boom, we should see the S&P 500 roll over. And what have we seen? We see a rollover in the, commo- in the uh, S&P 500. This could go higher, which means that we might be and I don't know for sure, uh, we might be here, or maybe we're not. Maybe we're actually here or here, and we still have some more downside on the first leg. The, 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 we'll call it the, the first low down leg. So I could take this. I could maybe uh, grab this here. And I haven't done this, guys. I'm doing it with you. And maybe what we've got, and there's your there's your kind of collapse there, is a move of what potentially could be the topping pattern of, look at that, it actually fits quite well, <laughs> of what could happen in in the S&P 500. And you can see that the pullback is this guy here, the pullback, this is over accentuated because we've got the uh, COVID crash in there, which pulled this thing back. We came all the way up and now maybe maybe we're going to do something like that. Maybe we don't. Maybe this is um, consolidated up like this, and it's a lot smaller, and it looks something on the lines of, I got to blow this up a little bit. Maybe it's on the lines of something like that, right? Where we come on back, and it's somewhere in that vicinity, and we actually go higher, which very well could be the case too. So I don't, I'm not saying that this is completely done. Maybe we go up, maybe we hit the peak here and we put in some sort of pattern uh, that is a consolidation pattern, uh, much like these guys here. So we put another bottom one in here, something like that. And we come back up, we hit it, and we come back down. And the, the, the way that this thing usually runs is this is an increasing interest rate environment here and we get a pullback with that froth in the technology market and a lot of stocks because they need to be repriced lower to an increasing interest rate environment. Once they're repriced lower and earnings continue to go up, we get a move higher here when the housing market is strong and the interest rates are stable. They're not necessarily increasing or decreasing all that much. So we get another growth phase. And then what happens here is at the peak, this correlates with the housing market and this is the housing market crash. So we come all the way back down. So this here is a revaluation of the stock market with an increasing interest rate environment. This here is a crash that was created by the housing market um, being in oversupply and a deleveraging type of event. It's basically a fear event that everything's crashing. And you can also see that we see the waves back here in the SP 500 in the 1960s all the way to 19. Uh, 82, which is the bottom. That would have been a great buying opportunity for the S&P 500 because you're coming into a large disinflationary disinflationary period from the population, uh, a, de- a decreasing interest rate environment, and that's like you know euphoria for stocks, and that was the, the big bull market. But right now, I think that we're entering the euphoria for a commodity bull market, and we are also seeing evidence that the increasing interest rate environment has weighed on stocks. That's why we had a pullback. I think that we will also see a, a stock market go up when this is complete, the second wave. It'll go higher. It'll probably peak at some point, maybe even go above it. And then we come back down with a crash when the housing market builds too many homes in an oversupply phase. So this is also agreeing with this pullback that the stock market is in the early stages of the commodity bull market. Now, I don't know for sure that this is the bottom of the market. We very well could go lower. Um, that is a possibility. And what drives that is going to be your 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 10-year yield, your, your interest rate. And your interest rate is what's going to basically have people, um, they're, they're, they're going to be able to speculate in stocks. They're going to want to speculate when the interest rate goes down. And if the interest rate keeps going higher, it's going to slow down the the uh, stock market and the housing market too, but the stock market. 
But to me, it looks like we are breaking to the upside and we could see a further move to the upside in, in yields, interest rates going higher. Uh, is a possibility. We'll still see. I'm not claiming victory. I'm just saying that's, I'm not playing anything with, with yields. I'm just saying that's what could potentially be happening. So those are some more indications, more data that is unbiased the way, at least it's, it's, it's as biased as the way that I can read the charts. Uh, but that's the raw data that I look at. And you can see bottoming patterns in everything that is commodity related, uh, even the CRB index. And, you know, other things that we look at, you know, the CRB to S&P 500, that ratio, we can see a downtrend line is broken. Uh, that's where the new paradigm where commodities will all perform. Wave one, the pullback for wave two. And then I do think eventually when that, that pullback's done, we're going to see a, a huge outperformance of commodities in a third leg, um, which is going to really be a game changer for most people if they're invested during that leg. Um, that's where the wealth uh, creation <laughs> is, is accounted for. And um, that's where wealth creation is accounted for in stocks. This is where wealth creation is going to account for in commodities when this thing kind of all unwinds. So we're seeing it across all the ratios that I that I look at. We're seeing uh, commodities come out a positive way. Um, I think precious metals will do incredibly well. Uh, and I think even real estate could do incredibly well, especially if you have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage in a highly inflationary environment that lasts 10, 20 years. Um, and again, that's not advice, guys. You guys take this information for whatever you need to. But that's what I'm seeing. And what I've done uh, you know how I did the fractal with oil and natural gas. Um, the companies are creating those fractals too. And I'm combing through all the companies that I can. Uh, I also have people on uh, the website. We're basically a community helping each other out now. They're scanning too. And, and we're all finding things. We're coming to the plat platinum question and answer sessions, trying to figure out you know, what companies look good. We're looking at the fractals. We're looking at the patterns. We're looking at earnings. We're looking at um, the technical chart patterns, we're looking at everything that we can. Um, I'm using every tool that I know of to my ability to try to best position the portfolio. And maybe I'll talk tomorrow about strategies and portfolio. And I'm not a portfolio manager or anything like that. Um, I just look at things from a particular viewpoint and I'll share the, that viewpoint with you in the future of, of what exactly I'm doing uh, to some extent. I'm not going to share everything, but I'm, I'll share some of it. Of, of what's going on. And I share everything with the platinum members. You can even see my portfolio. Um, you just can't see the amounts or anything like that. I just kind of state what they are, the, the holdings and which ones are overweight, and which ones are kind of normal weight, I, I'll call it. And I talk a lot about it, but that's, um, that's what I've got here, guys, all that data. And I'm, I'm combing through a bunch of different fractals, finding the largest fractals with the best fundamentals uh, of the companies with the highest probabilities of success, at least I think there were some of the highest probabilities of success, which could really add the juice to the portfolio for the third leg. That's where the value is. <laughs> that's the website if you guys want to look at it, finding-value.com. Uh, but that's what I've got for today, guys. Um, hopefully you guys are doing all right. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And uh, I'll catch you next time. Maybe we'll talk about strategies and stuff like that. All right. Catch you next time. This is Finding Value.